Welcome back to the second presentation of the morning. It's my great pleasure to introduce Felix Agarkov. Felix is uh, one of the leading experts when it comes to translating machine learning into healthcare. He holds a PhD in, in machine learning. He is a successful entrepreneur, has um, co-founded two SMEs. He's the, the director and owner of Fematics which uh, is one of the companies represented in our network, which was also represented in uh, the predecessor network, um, MLPM, which ran from 2013 to 2016. So translating machine learning into healthcare, into to medicine, into really into the clinic is an extremely difficult and um, effortful process. And Felix uh, knows extremely much about, about this. So he's really one of the experts that are working on this, that are turning this into a success that really make this happen. And this always impresses me when, when listening uh, to Felix. So often we come from basic research. We think that machine learning solutions will have a, cl a deep clinical impact. Sometimes we underestimate how long this path is from the uh, computer to the bedside and Felix uh, knows how long the path is and masters many steps along this path uh, with a, a successful company Fematics. So uh, I'm very much uh, looking forward to uh, his presentation now and uh, to, to learn more to gain new insights which I do every time I listen to to Felix. Thank you very much for being here and we are looking forward to your talk Felix. Thank you very much, Karsten, uh, for the amazing introduction. Uh, machine learning and modern healthcare. When I think about a citation which describes the process of how we innovate in healthcare, I almost always think about this very timely citation. He who innovates will have for his enemies all those who are well off under the existing order of things and only lukewarm supporters in those who might be better off under the new. This lukewarm temper rises partly from the fear of adversaries who have the loss on their side, and partly from the, uh, from the incredulity of mankind who will never admit the merit of anything new until they have seen it proved by the event. So it's a very timely citation. Nicola Machiavelli, 1532. And uh, I think this is really uh, an explanation of the process which uh, we have to go through when we try to innovate in healthcare. So let me maybe highlight some challenges. And I'll, uh, I'll start with the history. And please bear with me, it will not be, at least the start of this talk is not so much about algorithms, but mostly about processes. Um, so as an example, let's look at telehealth. Uh, remote monitoring of patients. Uh, the first mentioning of this appeared in 1879 in the Lancet uh, about the use of telephones to reduce unnecessary doctor visits. And uh, most of the space in the article was actually about the fear of telephone and uh, uh, how people are afraid to maybe give phone calls. In 1920, radios were used for providing clinical support on ships. In 1925, there was a drawing uh, in one of the journals uh, or magazines showing uh, a remote communication between a doctor and the nurse and the patient. And uh, uh, basically that was matching some kind of a video, a radio with a video uh, to diagnose the condition. Of course, it was uh, completely made up. Uh, in 1948, radiological images were sent by telephone from Pennsylvania to Philadelphia. So we can see that maybe uh, it was about 70 years um, uh, from the time um, remote uh, monitoring was mentioned to the time when images started to be sent. So in 5960, there was a telecommunication link between Nebraska Psychiatric Institute and Norfolk Medical Hospital. In 1961, USSR and USA used remote monitoring to test animals in space. And in 73, telehealth was actually used to provide healthcare in rural areas in Arizona. Uh, 
Um, a few years later, we can see how long actually it took uh, for telehealth to, uh, to get established. But in 85, 88, telehealth was providing care in Mexico due to earthquake. So it needed a push uh, for something to start happening. 93, American Telemedicine Association was formed. And then 2013, uh, when there was uh, an increased interest in telehealth, uh, there was a major trial in the UK and actually some other major trials showing that telehealth was not cost effective compared with the usual care. In fact, in 2018, in December, I think, there were some guidelines issued uh, in the UK saying that uh, for some conditions, uh, telemonitoring was not more cost effective than usual care. There is no convincing evidence for the effectiveness of telehealth monitoring to reduce exacerbations, in this case, in chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Then in 2020, in the new post COVID world, there was a 78%, uh, not percent, but 78 fold growth in telehealth in just two months. From, 20 to, uh, from February to April 2020. And now this level stabilized at about 37 fold growth uh, compared with the pre pandemic levels. The growth was uh, largely driven by patient and provider uptake and also by the growing uh, developing regulatory changes. So um, there are some uh, recent estimates saying that 26% of patients, in fact, are interested in using telehealth. 57% of providers also look at it now more favorably than before COVID. And um, now um, there are new reimbursement codes. So basically state systems, health systems, and payers, insurance companies are more happy to reimburse telehealth. But uh, it took quite a long time, uh, over probably 140 years uh, for this technology to become established. Now, if you look at the challenges which were faced by telehealth, uh, by this telehealth intervention, you can perhaps learn a little uh, about what can be done to help us uh, develop AI and machine learning solutions, AI interventions, and shift uh, as those interventions bring them to, uh, to the providers, uh, to the front line. And uh, we should say that telehealth interventions, which are really just about shifting to remote consultations by telephone, for example, uh, is relatively low tech compared with artificial intelligence and machine learning, because care is still provided by clinicians and uh, it's only delivered virtually. Uh, it was a long pathway to adoption. And um, there are still some major providers concerns, even now, and some patients concerns. So providers, uh, in, uh, now in 2021, uh, ask questions about security, about workflow integration, effectiveness, compar uh, comparison with standard care, reimbursement, and patients may have, uh, have uh, some of the same questions, but also questions about effectiveness, accessibility, how easy it is to use telehealth, and so forth, and whether it's covered by insurance. So um, I would say that uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning interventions uh, we'll have many of the same problems, but many additional barriers um, because uh, it's a more advanced intervention in many ways. So let's look at the path to adoption. It's a major challenge. Uh, first, uh, when we are doing research and development, even if we manage to develop a good, well-performing, robust predictive model, it's far from clear how we can convert the predictions of the models to safe, efficacious, cost-effective, timely, practical, scalable interventions. So we can make predictions, but uh, it's going to be safe. It's going to be time-effective to actually act on that prediction. And what could be the best way of doing that? Uh, there are regulatory challenges. So the development before we adopt something in healthcare needs to be um, to certain standards. Uh, also, um, we, uh, our products, our algorithms and devices, which are built on top of those algorithm software, uh, it needs to be certified. Um, and um, this is basically to demonstrate safety. But even if algorithms are robust, uh, and even if they're safe, uh, it's important to show that those algorithms are also safe, not only in the lab, but in the real world. What's going to happen if data is not available? What's going to happen if some variables are missing? Uh, what's going to happen if there are outliers? So basically, uh, we should be robust to them. If you can demonstrate safety, 
it's still uh, quite important to demonstrate efficacy and cost effectiveness. So we will need to uh, perform clinical validations quite often in prospective trials. Uh, and uh, of course, it may happen that even if we run a trial and the trial is successful, we still need to be able to uh, demonstrate added value of uh, over the standard care. So we may have a useful algorithm, but what could be the added value on top of what's already implemented? Is it really useful to actually uh, for the health systems and providers or payers to invest into a new process? Then there need to be new developments and new requirements tracking the marketplace. Um, about data governance, privacy, interoperability, good practice. So we may have gone through all the clinical trials and safety and everything, but we haven't really developed a product or um, an algorithm and software uh, which uh, respects local laws or national laws and uh, doesn't really adhere to good practice and then uh, it's of no use. And uh, the final point is a reimbursement. Even if you have uh, done everything well, it may happen that um, you know no one really wants to use it. No one wants to pay for it. No one wants to use it. And the reason for this may be that, well, maybe we created a very good product for clinicians, but that product may, uh, for example, need some data from the patient and the interests and needs of patients were not considered. So patients don't use uh, our app or don't use our system, don't supply our uh, data, uh, which our uh, AI models may need to use. And in this case, basically, uh, uh, the product becomes of no use to clinicians either because we haven't really taken all the needs of all the stakeholders into account. So uh, it's just a snapshot of uh, a path to adoption um, and uh, digital technology assessment after we were through clinical trials, for example, to get adopted in the NHS, there are additional questions about uh, evidence on the outcomes. This usually comes from clinical trials and clinical safety. All the data protection, security, usability and accessibility. Have you thought what, uh, what's going to happen if patients are unable to impute data, for instance? or uh, provide some readouts or clinicians are unable to do this. Or, um, you know, uh, if you are building a patient-facing product, what happens for people with disabilities and so forth? Interoperability, we need to integrate into workflows and technical stability, basically questions of what's going to happen under data shifts and uh, our models and so forth. And uh, only after uh, we've been through this process, we can access marketplaces and uh, with the NHS may endorse uh, a model um, uh, in the UK. Uh, it's uh, important to understand about multiple stakeholders in this. And um, uh, some of them are providers, basically people or institutions which provide uh, healthcare services. Uh, we, uh, again, the needs of those providers and the needs of stakeholders will be quite different in different locations. And uh, it's very important to actually try to understand those needs. And uh, some of you may be asking yourself, why are we speaking about this? Why are we not really speaking about machine learning at this stage? Providers and vendors and players, what is all this about? Why do we need this? Now, we need to understand the needs of multiple stakeholders so that we can solve the right kinds of questions, right? We can address the right kinds of problems and uh, we can define objective functions of our models. Uh, you know, in a more sensible manner, which will take uh, the interests and the real needs of multiple stakeholders, uh, if you pay a little bit of attention to this. So providers, um, many of them want to spend uh, less time and money to provide high quality health care. We know many providers are busy, especially now post-COVID, with big backlogs. Uh, if you can develop something which can come to the right conclusion quickly and perhaps less uh, expensively, uh, you know, uh, at lower cost, it's going to be good. Providers will probably like this. Now, providers may want to increase the market share by reducing false negatives. Of course, it depends on the reimbursement system. For example, if providers need to compete for patients, like in the United States, false negatives uh, not providing care to people who need this care is going to be bad. Also, you may potentially get sued for this. Uh, vendors, oh, sorry, vendors, developers, they want to be able to develop as quickly as possible with minimal hurdles. Questions about data access, questions about regulations. If you can somehow develop models uh, or uh, algorithms or AI powered solutions to help vendors to develop better products, vendors, developers will probably like this. 
uh, they also want to increase and retain uh, their market share. Patients want to stay healthy as long as possible, and ideally with least effort and ideally at no cost or at very low cost. So we need to be able to engage patients. They are actually key stakeholders in many cases. And payers, insurers, employers, sometimes it may be a national uh, system, a state system, they want to avoid unnecessary costs. Quite often, uh, it reduces uh, the um, uh, false positives. Can we really not provide expensive care to those who don't need it? And uh, again, um, of course, false positives and false negatives may be important for multiple stakeholders here. And uh, it's quite important in every system, in every condition, to try to understand what could be the real needs. Uh, just a very simple example, uh, if our pro uh, if you're trying to develop, say, a self-management product, a product uh, or an algorithm which helps patients to self-manage, it's quite important to be able to engage the right kinds of stakeholders for it. If, for example, providers are paid by volume, for example, if provi a provider uh, organization, a GP practice, for example, is paid by the number of patients they serve, they may potentially be interested in a product or in an algorithm which helps patients self-manage. Patients can stay at home, they can self-manage, they don't go to GPs so often, and uh, GPs will still get paid and they can um, have free time and provide services really to the people who need those services. But payers, on the other hand, will not really be interested in this kind of product because payers, insurers, or uh, health systems will be paying providers anyway uh, based on the number of patients which, uh, which are being served. And for every intervention, for everything we develop, for every kind of um, product, condition, you know, any use case, we really need to try to understand who the stakeholders are, who would be the right people to engage, and uh, how we can define our objective functions. Um, I will now uh, give a few uh, outlines of the challenges from the point of view of clinicians and key opinion leaders. It's based on a recent survey and uh, interviews by McKinsey, uh, 237 interviews and surveys of providers, investors, vendors, and uh, some barriers which were identified from those interviews, specifically for AI and machine learning, were about evidence of safety, efficacy, and cost effectiveness. Uh, the key principle, first, do no harm. Not doing harm is more important in this space than uh, potentially innovate. And also, any innovation will need to add value over established processes in the real world. Uh, we must demonstrate quality of AI and machine learning solutions, robustness for new populations, uh, completeness um, of underlying data sets, biases will need to be handled, data leakage needs to be handled. For example, sometimes it might happen that the code for a condition or the code uh, for an event happening in a hospital appears a few days later, uh, you know, after a patient started getting some levels of care. And then uh, getting, uh, for example, a medication to treat the condition will be uh, identified as a predictor of a condition itself, just because the condition was uh, recorded several days later. So this kind of data leakage is common. And uh, it's important, actually, when we develop our AI solutions to really understand the process of how um, uh, data is recorded and what's happening to it, because it will affect quality. Lack of multidisciplinary development. Uh, now, COVID uh, is probably not going to be a trigger in contrast to telehealth, but rather a challenge. Now it's going to be so difficult to engage with clinicians, uh, at least for many long-term conditions because of the backlog. Practicality of the solutions. Solutions need to be driven by real needs and not only by the accessibility of data. And uh, we also need to integrate within workflows and whatever we develop uh, needs to be easy to use. And uh, of course, uptake. Um, uh, there is a uh, limited clar uh, if there is a limited clarity on uh, how decisions are made by these models, then people will not necessarily trust it. So some uh, words um, of uh, the interview stakeholders, and that comes from 237 surveys of McKinsey and some of our own surveys of clinicians and patients uh, in relation to AI and machine learning. And um, these are basically some, uh, just some words. Uh, they're holding our lives 
Uh, we are holding lives in our hands. We need proof that it works, and you have to convince people with the results. Uh, it's difficult for regulators to trust something that is difficult to assess. I don't know how feasible AI predictions would be, say, in severe patients. We are stuck with crazy definitions of outcomes. I'm not sure about the ability of AI to predict the risks. So this is a quality question. And it relates, for example, to the challenge of how we define output. Sometimes uh, outputs which we are trying to predict may be subjective. And um, clinicians may have concerns about using machine learning models for this. If your AI solution works, it would be brilliant. But we tested some solution in the past and had problems with, uh, uh, with them. So uh, past experience, uh, negative experience, of course, is bad. I don't understand machine learning models. The models I've seen don't use medical knowledge. I don't know what these models are telling me and why. It's easy to be driven, but what we can do with the data rather than with the clinical need. Uh, we could have helped to design something much more useful and likely to be used, but we were not involved upfront and now it's too late. So these are just some typical examples. And there are additional challenges which vendors, investors, and frontline people uh, identify. When it comes to startup executives, it's lack of interoperability and also data sharing. Uh, data issues really dominate many of these for startups and for uh, investors. For healthcare profession uh, professionals, it's lack of skill, education, funding, basically, uh, is mentioned quite a lot as additional challenges. When it comes to these executives, there are additional challenges. So 2,400 C-level executives, multiple sectors, not only healthcare, multiple KPMG uh, surveys, only 35% of people trust in their own AI and machine learning solutions and data analytics processes. 93% of healthcare exec uh, executives agreed about the need for a code of ethics. 92% uh, of healthcare executives question trustworthiness of data and models, and we are concerned about reputation and litigation. And uh, there are also concerns about data quality and privacy violations, potential biases um, are also mentioned very often. So once we understand that, once we understand those kinds of needs and pain points, uh, we may potentially think about which AI and machine learning models and uh, approaches could offer opportunities for solving those challenges. But let's speak about ethics first. This, is, uh, this comes from policymakers, and now we can see a lot of policies around integrity of solutions. So basically, inference and learning um, should be proper. Um, um, people care about appropriateness of how data sets are used, control for data quality, no data leakage, interpretability, so clarity about how predictions are made, robustness, robustness under new conditions, uh, new populations, new interventions, new outcomes, new clinical settings. Uh, for example, um, a new intervention may still be uh, the same kind of a drug, or it may be the same kind of model, but it may be used, you know, slightly differently um, uh, without, for example, the support of a clinician in place. And then uh, it would be a new intervention. And we need to show that whatever uh, validation we made and whatever evidence we collected for safety and cost effectiveness, our um, downstream developments on top of the algorithms and models are still robust and fairness the lack of biases, prejudice, ensuring that protected variables are not associated with predictor variables, for example. Or, or for instance, we cannot uh, predict uh, protect, uh, protected variables from the model's performance. So some kind of good uh, uh, uniformity and high quality performance across multiple strata of patients. And uh, we may already potentially think about various ways of addressing those needs. So let's speak about opportunities for AI and machine learning uh, at the research and development stage. So what can we do? What kind of opportunities might exist for us uh, when we develop new solutions in relation to evidence? Now, remember, it's added value over established processes of solutions. Uh, one question we can try to ask ourselves, how can we configure our models to formally generalize established processes? For instance, there may be already established risk scores which clinicians use in practice. 
we can potentially try to use those established G scores uh, as features, priors, experts, and a meta model uh, in an ensemble of some kind. And then, if we are careful, we might potentially be able to demonstrate that whatever we develop will formally improve on uh, uh, what's currently being used. Quality, robustness for new settings, accounting for situations and training data is not the same as the test data. Possible shifts in the PICO, population intervention comparison and outcomes. Um, comparison relates to the baseline. Well, what are we going to compare our models with? Uh, Co-development, nothing really um, uh, replaces co-development from, um, uh, we, we, we still need to involve uh, uh, stakeholders to co-develop, but perhaps we can use information from guidelines and evidence reviews, clinical trials, primary research articles to constrain our hypothesis space. And maybe we can be clever about how we aggregate this, uh, this information from prior knowledge by using machine learning. Uh, practicality and data issues, access to data robustness, so we already can think about data efficiency using prior knowledge, pre-trained models, published results, and uptake. For instance, uh, we can consider explainable models if possible, or at least we can try to approximate complex models by simpler models. So let's look uh, in a bit more detail in this last point about how to improve uptake, because we can probably, if we are careful enough, we can probably handle evidence and we can probably handle quality, but what can we, how can we ensure uptake by the end users? Well, uh, let's look at explainable AI or XAI a little bit. And this relates uh, to one of the statements made by a senior clinician whom we interviewed, who was saying, I don't understand machine learning models. I don't know what those models are telling me and why. Perhaps uh, the uptake may be improved by improving explainability. And many machine learning models are black boxes, not really explaining predictions or decisions in a way which is understood by uh, experts. And there are multiple procedures uh, clarifying how such black box models may work often based on production of uh, a post hoc approximation of complex model, for example. And this explainable AI needs to be, um, you know, differentiated from constraining models to be interpretable by design, for example, by using uh, those models which we think are a bit easier to understand or those models uh, uh, which use domain knowledge. Sometimes uh, people speak about interpretable machine learning, explainable machine learning, uh, XAI, and uh, there are some differences between them, but sometimes those terms are used interchangeably. We'll speak mostly about explainable AI. So uh, how can we open black, uh, black boxes? Uh, we can try to explain what's happening inside, or we can try to design a transparent model. And when we are trying to explain what's happening inside, we can try to explain the model uh, globally, basically take outputs of our model, um, uh, which uh, could be difficult to explain, and fit a global model to mimic the behavior of uh, the, black box, uh, the black box function F. Um, there are local explanations, outcome explanations. So uh, can we construct uh, a locally explainable model GFX mimicking F of X, this black box model of some input? For example, why does the model classify patient X as a case or a control? Those kinds of questions, which may potentially address the concerns of the clinicians. Why for this patient, a model is telling me something? What can we learn about this? And we can also uh, think about model inspection. So uh, trying to vary X and see what's going to happen with our uh, with the predictions of our black box models. In some cases, this can elucidate uh, and explain to some extent what, uh, what's happening inside. Well, one family of methods uh, which are commonly used in explainable AI are saliency maps, relatively old, but still very, very useful. Visualization of image areas explaining predictions, for example, of deep convolutional neural networks they may be used to visualize a notion of a class captured by a trained model. And um, if S sub C of I is a score of class C computed by a model on image I, what we really care about is to try to uh, construct an image which maximizes the score uh, subject to some penalty with respect uh, to the image. So we are basically for a given class, uh, we may want 
to uh, construct, for example, an image in this case uh, by uh, optimizing the score with respect uh, to the image and not with respect to the parameters. This can potentially give us a visualization of what's happening. Well, what could be a typical representation of cases or what could be a typical representation of progressors of a disease? And uh, people uh, often use some normalized scores, and there are some technicalities here uh, to get better visualizations. And there are many extensions of those approaches. So uh, this figure is from Simonian 2013, where um, we get representative images of many common classes, bell peppers, and kid foxes, and huskies, by uh, optimizing the scores with respect to images. Uh, we can go conditional and try to visualize the saliency map for a given image and class. For example, if, you're given, uh, if we have a radiology image and the patient is classified as, for example, uh, a patient with cancer, what could be the uh, representation of that? So given some image I0, class C, and the train, uh, a trained model assigning the scores, we, can, uh, want, um, uh, we may want to rank uh, the pixels uh, of our given image based on the influence on the scores. For linear scoring functions, if we did have a deep neural network, for example, but if we had a linear model, uh, then our interpretation of the importance of pixels would be very simple. We would just take uh, those uh, weights uh, which have the highest magnitudes. And um, if we are dealing with a nonlinear model, then we can come up with the first order Taylor approximation at I0. So we can say that, well, maybe uh, we uh, produce a linear approximation of the scores and we uh, Taylor expand around the original image. And uh, this will tell us which pixels need to change the least to have the most impact on the class predictions for a given image. Computations of those derivatives could be done by back propagation, and there are many ways to improve this and get more intuitive uh, uh, visualizations. So again, from Simonian 2013, we can get basically the pixels, those saliency maps um, corresponding to uh, given images. What classifies this as a dog or what classifies this as a boat? And this is, uh, this is potentially quite useful. Saliency maps may help to identify the parts of images predicting a certain class. And this example is from Zach uh, 2018, a rather famous example that uh, people have found out that uh, when trying to classify pneumonia, the parts of the image which were responsible uh, for the classifications, which actually were quite good in the training set, those parts of the images corresponded to some uh, artificial tokens, artificial findings, tokens which radiologists have put on the patients here on the shoulder. So no radiology features or very few of the radiology features uh, scored highly uh, in the saliency map uh, explanations. So uh, basically, uh, this is an example of how we may potentially identify biases. And similar things uh, can be used to identify various spurious correlations in images. Uh, now, this looks good and we sometimes use it uh, to try to understand what's happening with our predictions. Does it really answer the question of explainability? And there are recent arguments that no, uh, saliency maps may potentially be useful. Uh, they may also, however, sometimes give a false sense of understanding. We know um, where a model is looking to make a prediction, but we don't really know what's going to happen with that region, what, what the model is doing with that region of pixels. And what's shown here is from Rudin 2019, uh, an evidence for an animal being a husky or an, uh, an evidence for an animal being a flute, a musical instrument. And we can see nearly identical saliency maps here. So, uh, we may potentially get very similar saliency maps for the same uh, and uh, get very similar explanations for quite different classes. Uh, and this is especially uh, an issue for noisy predictions of machine learning models in medicine. So we know where, uh, where we are looking, but we don't really know what's happening in this region we are, which we are looking at. So there are arguments saying that no, it's not really a true explanation. So 
other families of models uh, to highlight and elucidate feature uh, importance and maybe explain what's driving our predictions or um, um, with the models uh, um, or rather uh, the uh, LIME method, uh, local interpretable model agnostic explanations using simpler functions to explain a complex function uh, in its locality. For example, uh, we may define families of relatively simple functions, classes, trees, rules of various kinds, and uh, we can impose various constraints on what we can expect from a good explanation. Uh, so a good explanation should provide a quality of understanding of how input variables relate to the outcomes. And also, uh, we may need uh, to potentially consider user's constraints. For example, sparsity might sometimes be very important, sometimes it may not be enough. Uh, for very high dimensional problems, sparsity may not be a sufficient condition for explainability. We may need to impose additional constraints on the families of models, the uh, G, um, the family of explainable models which we use. Also, explanations uh, ideally need to be easy to understand, which is not necessarily true of the uh, original features X. So what's happening in Lime uh, and the many feature important methods is that we project our original features X to a simpler space of, for example, binary features X prime. And also we should accurately mimic complex predictions, at least locally. Remember, we are trying to find an, uh, an approximation, uh, a linear or a decision tree approximation uh, on, uh, of a complex model. So uh, we want local uh, fidelity, local consistency and accuracy uh, of approximating uh, a complex function by something simple. Ideally, uh, we want a method which is model agnostic, so F can be treated as a black box. So uh, what's the idea uh, of this uh, family of methods? Let's speak about this uh, in a bit more detail because uh, uh, it, it is used often and uh, it gives rise to a family of more complicated models which are quite popular nowadays. So the idea is to find locally accurate approximations of a black box function from a high dimensional space. Um, uh, we are assuming that the function, this complex function maps from high dimensional space, for example, to uh, a scalar in this case. Uh, X could be a vector of features and X prime, um, a set of more easily explainable, more easily interpretable features could live in the binary space, and P prime uh, could be a lower dimensional space of binary features, and D prime could be some random perturbation of X prime. Uh, and uh, so that we can, uh, we can try to explore how sensitive our functions going to be to when we try to uh, perturb some explainable or some relatively easy to interpret features. We can also define a mapping back, back from T prime to the original space um, so that we can reconstruct original inputs or, or inputs in the original space. Uh, to see uh, how good uh, our approximations are. And we can impose penalties on the uh, uh, on this approximation surrogate G. For example, we can penalize the number of non-zero elements in linear regression, for example, um, uh, or we can use lesser penalties, or we can use uh, the depth of a decision tree uh, based on what family of simple functions we use. For example, we can say that H is an electronic health record or some representation of an electronic health record. X prime could be a simpler representation, uh, a binary representation, which relates to the presence of terms describing medical conditions. D prime could be a random perturbation of X prime, and D could be a reconstructed uh, electronic health record with some perturbations in medical terms. Yeah. So, optimization in this case uh, is a simple approximation of complex function by using local perturbations. So this is a Lyme objective function. For a family, uh, for a function in, uh, in the family of explainable functions, we are trying to minimize a loss between the ground truth, uh, this complex model, uh, between our simple approximation, the proximity measure between perturbed and the original samples with some penalty over here. And we can define various kinds of losses. For example, we can say that uh, when we are dealing with regression, we want uh, a small uh, square distance between our uh, black box model and our simple explanation of this black box model. And the proximity is basically defined by how close our original uh, electronic health record was to the electronic health record, which uh, we managed to obtain uh, by uh, perturbing some explainable features. And the penalty could be a number of non-zero elements. 
for example, the constraint on the number of elements, which uh, which are non-zero, and there are various uh, tractable ways of approximating those constraints. So what we are doing in this specific feature importance example, we allow F to be a complex model predicting outcomes, for example, in the electronic health record X. We convert the electronic health record into a simpler vector X prime, saying which terms are present, which terms are not present. We sample uh, D prime by turning off some medical words, some key terms uh, to, uh, to see what's going to happen to our approximations. We project D prime, you know, the uh, simpler representation of uh, the medical terms back into the original electronic health record. Some of the key terms will be missing in this representation. We now compute F of D. We are trying to make a prediction. What would the black mo a box model predict if some of the explainable features were turned off or perturbed? And uh, we then penalize uh, the error, the discrepancy between what a black, mo uh, a black box model does in this case and what a simpler model would do in this case, subject uh, to some um, uh, complexity constraints in the parameters of the model. So what we are getting is a locally linear approximation of complex function by using a simpler function and also by using simpler features. So we are getting a simpler function, a linear model, for example, uh, or decision tree, a simpler function G, but we are also getting simpler features, those features X prime, those features D prime. So when uh, this was applied uh, to various data sets, it's uh, from Ribeiro 2016. Uh, we uh, can see uh, what happens, which words, for example, in the text classification task turn out to be predictive of various classes. And this is a class, uh, the binary classification of essayism and Christianity. And um, uh, we are comparing, uh, basically trying to elucidate, trying to see which features, which keywords drive the predictions of black box models, in this case, SVMs with uh, RBF kernels. And uh, we can see which words are responsible for predicting Christianity and which words are responsible for predicting atheism. And the argument is that maybe this model two in particular is not very useful. When we look at this, we can see that uh, posting, host, rare, you know, those terms which appear in the headers of emails, they appear to be driving the predictions of the model. And this is despite the fact that the model turned out to be very accurate on test data, um, uh, over 94% accuracy for a well-balanced data set. So we could potentially, without trying to see what's happening with the features, we could try to improve the accuracy and get um, or other performance metrics, and get to 99%. But it turns out that the key terms and the key factors driving those predictions are not very useful, then maybe we should really consider other kinds of models. And uh, model one is a little bit uh, better, but we can still see that any one of these could be drivers of Christianity uh, class. So potentially we can try to improve this. So uh, Lime is uh, an instance of additive feature attribution methods. Our explanation uh, is uh, a linear combination of some kinds of binary features. Yeah, so basically this is the same explanation that we have seen. E prime uh, is a feature uh, in the potentially lower dimensional binary feature space. Some kind of simplified input features. Uh, is this medical term present or not? Is um, a such and such feature present or not? Um, yeah, is variable above certain threshold or not? So um, there are uh, ways uh, of how we can construct such uh, representations. Now, an approach which is used uh, more and more frequently, which is called CHAP, assigns feature importance um, according to this uh, expression over here. So for our sample X and for the black box model F, we assign important, uh, importance to feature I based on uh, basically how important this feature I is for varying, for perturbing our output, the output of our black box model. So we are looking at the difference uh, of the output of the black box model um, um, in the simple uh, fe uh, feature space Z prime where feature I is included. And we are looking at the output of the black box model where this feature is excluded. And we weight it by certain coefficients and we repeat this for all possible combinations and subsets of, um, uh, of features. 
um, uh, which um, uh, in our subset of explainable, uh, uh, explainable features. This expression is not easily computable, but there are efficient approximations of this. And basically, the intuition is very simple. If feature i leads to big changes in the output uh, of our black box model, then it should get higher weighting. And uh, we can repeat this, we could potentially repeat this, we could feed multiple models uh, an, uh, an exponential number of times. We could get uh, an exact feature, uh, uh, important, uh, important feature attribution in this way. Uh, it's uh, intractable, but there are ways to compute this. So uh, it turns out that um, the features and uh, feature importance values described in that way um, have several very important and uh, attractive properties. Property of local accuracy, so when simplified inputs don't change, then the approximation is faithful to the model. So uh, if you take our simple feature X prime projected back to the original space, then the prediction of the black box model is the same uh, as the approximation G. Uh, when some features are missing, they have no impact. It's also perhaps what we can understand. If the feature is not a feature is not present, maybe it shouldn't really contribute to how we make predictions. Uh, and uh, there is a property of consistency for any two models. Feature I is more important for that model, uh, where it makes a bigger impact on the predictions. So if there is model F prime, and um, if there is model F, and it turns out that feature I makes a bigger prediction uh, in the black box model F prime, then uh, it would get a higher weighting in the model F prime. So all these are desirable properties. And it turns out that the only additive feature attribution method which satisfies all these properties is exactly the shape um, 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 attribution, which was defined on the previous slide here. And uh, shape is used very, very often and um, uh, to elucidate what's happening with models. And this is also model agnostic. And uh, we have well, literally just literally just scratched the surface here. There are so many different ways to try to explain predictions of multiple models. Many works um, uh, just uh, in the survey 2018, I think shape is not really mentioned here. There are many more different approaches now um, based on what kind of black box models are used. Sometimes it's entirely agnostic, sometimes it's specifically about deep neural nets and uh, images like um, with uh, Simonian's uh, salient and so forth. Uh, but we can ask ourselves the question, how relevant or useful is all this to improving clinical uptake? Say we can explain the features. Is it really useful to engage clinicians? Is this what clinicians want? It's important to try to understand the criticism be uh, behind feature importance issues. Uh, it's a Nature Machine Intelligence 2019 uh, by Rudin, uh, who's saying that uh, we should really try to stop explaining black box machine learning models for high stake decisions. And we should use explainable models, interpretable models instead. So the observation is that rather than creating models which are inherently interpretable, uh, explainable AI creates a post hoc model to explain a complex uh, black box model F. This may lead to unreliable and potentially misleading explanations if our approximation is not faithful to the original model. So say uh, we have a complex black box model and we created an explanation, but the explanation is a poor fit to the original model. Then whatever we are trying to explain, we cannot really trust. And then people who don't trust the explanation will not really trust our black box. And basically the errors would amplify and we shouldn't really be using this, at least according to some arguments. In contrast, it's argued, models which are inherently interpretable would provide their own explanations faithful to what the model actually computes. So we can trust an explanation of an explainable model as long as we can fit the data well. And um, quite often explanations don't really provide enough detail to understand what's happening inside the black box. Yes, we may know that some features are important, but we don't really know how those features are going to be combined in the black box model. And uh, also when data are structured, it's argued that features uh, that are meaningful um, uh, about our task may perform, uh, and models which use meaningful features may perform similarly to more complex models. The small difference in the performance may potentially be outweighed by the 
uh, ability to interpret the results. So there are many advantages of using uh, inherently interpretable models, but explaining what's happening inside the black box is still quite useful, like in those salient examples. We can at least sometimes see that something really needs our attention. Perhaps uh, when we look at our saliency maps uh, in images, for instance, or when we look at the shape predictors, if those prediction, uh, predictors make a lot of sense, a lot of intuitive sense, we don't necessarily need to trust this. But if we see that uh, predictions or explanations don't really make much sense, perhaps it's a flag for us to go and try to improve our models or try to see what's happening in our data and so forth. Now, what about medical explainable AI? We are looking at explainability. Just remember, a possible way of improving uptake and trust of clinicians, payers, patients, and uh, multiple other stakeholders. But what do stakeholders really mean by explainability? There are no universally accepted metrics, and perhaps there are no you know, maybe maybe there are no metrics. Maybe this is so domain specific and so application specific that it's going to be difficult to define what's meant by explainability. Yet, although there are no formal criteria, many stakeholders, including policymakers, look at explainability as an important factor. Accuracy and performance are widely viewed as insufficient for clinical uptake at scale. So some way of explaining what we are doing is still useful. And there was a recent uh, survey or other interviews with 10 clinicians to try to understand specific equations in explainable medical AI. People were trying to find uh, answers to questions of which explanations are needed by end users and when, how those explanations could be addressed using machine learning, what could be uh, good explainability metrics. Um, it's a potentially interesting read. Um, we uh, get some intuitions about what's needed by clinicians, but uh, these questions are not fully answered, I feel. So what do people expect? Clinicians quite often need to justify their decisions to other stakeholders, and they would like the models to provide similar ways of justifications. So, uh, clinicians would expect alignment of expectations with evidence-based medical practice. Also transparency, when to use and when not to use the models. Inclusion criteria, exclusion criteria, interventions, you know, what's going to happen with the patient, what's happening with the patients when we are using our models. Definitions of the predicted outcomes. Sometimes we may be dealing with the same condition, but the outcome is defined subjectively in one hospital from a different hospital from a different geographic location. So those issues need to be taken into account. Models are allowed to make mistakes in some settings, as long as uh, it's clear why those mistakes are made. For example, uh, if a model makes a mistake, but we can say that this could happen because we are dealing with a different definition of an outcome, or we are dealing with a different population, maybe it's okay. Uh, models should be repeatedly successful for personalized patient level predictions in the real world. And it's also important to try to understand what drives predictions and why those predictions are made. So explainable AI outside medicine is trying to address some of the same questions, but um, maybe there are, there are arguments that maybe we are not completely there, but clinicians certainly want those kinds of explanations. I guess the key take home, which uh, we um, consider uh, when we are trying to explain our solutions in medicine is really this. If a feature is important in medicine, clinicians or stakeholders would expect it to be important in our AI models. If there is a very solid evidence of an importance of a feature, for example, from clinical trials or from evidence reviews, we would like to see this in our AI models. Now, if a feature turns out to be important in uh, our AI machine learning models when they come up with our explanations, uh, uh, it shouldn't be completely useless in medicine. We shouldn't know for sure that this is useless in medicine, right? So like in the example which we looked at, for example, tokens placed on the patients, clearly no radiological data is probably useless in medicine, but it's, uh, it turns out to be important in AI. It's an indication that maybe it's not a very important feature. We should go and do something else with our data and do something with our models or with our data sets. 
uh, more on medical AI, how to construct models exploiting medical evidence. And this is what we usually do in house. We are not really, it's quite important, we are not really uh, trying to construct an explainable model here. We are not really constraining ourselves to simple model classes, which are easy to explain, um, but we are building constraints which clinicians want uh, into this potentially complex function, to try to make this potentially complex function more explainable. So one very simple idea is to regularize around the published fun, uh, findings. For example, we can use informative priors, we could use informative regularizers. Most of the standard regularization methods penalize variations from zero, for example, ridge regression, LASA, and so forth. But uh, we can regularize around values which are known to be potentially useful, known from clinical trials, known from published research. And um, uh, W0 here could be the magnitude reported in the literature. And in that case, we will, um, you know, we will vary, we will fluctuate from the prior, which is validated in the existing evidence, only if the data really pushes us away from this. We can try to enrich feature spaces. And in genetics, quite often, polygenic risk scores are used. Uh, for example, we can look at linear combinations of uh, various SNPs. W0 could be the weights which we can get from the literature. We can do the same with clinical risk scores and various other models which may exist in the literature to enrich the feature space. Uh, if you use those clinical established clinical predictors like comorbidity scores, driving poor outcomes, if you use those additional predictors in our ensembles, maybe we can um, um, make sure that the remaining part of the model explains the residual structure. We can sometimes use shape constraints. A disease is associated with variation from the norm, which may be used to constrain the shape of a function. Let me uh, explain this a bit. Um, uh, this shows um, the probability of readmission uh, of a black box model uh, when we vary the heart rate. And we can see that maybe what's happening here kind of, uh, kind, of, kind of makes sense. We can see that the risks grow when the racing heart rate increases, but the risks also grow when the heart rate decreases. Quite often, linear models, simple explainable models using heart rate as a feature, they would probably see a line. So, uh, it would say that heart rate, a low value of the heart rate is good for you. But of course, if the heart rate is zero, it's not very good for a patient. And uh, similar non-monotonic trends, fluctuations from the normal, uh, they, uh, they happen in many vital signals. For example, for heart rate, bradycardia and tachycardia are the conditions. We can also get hypertension and hypertension, hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia, where similar kinds of non-monotonic shapes uh, could be expected. And then we can potentially use constraints, impose constraints based on the prior knowledge and the clinical understanding of the marginal risks into our models. Um, we could call it a shape constraint and, uh, for example, penalize quotations from those. So let's go back to further opportunities for AI and machine learning. We've spoken about uptake and explainability. Now, one other question, uh, which is of very high importance, is the question of quality. How do we account for possible data differences? The training data is not the same as the test data. Um, and uh, it may include, it may come at multiple different levels. Well, um, a solution for machine learning could be in transfer learning, really. Uh, we could look at those families of methods. Assume that we could train the model using a source data set with some inputs, some features, some outputs. For example, it may be a randomized control trial of a health, telehealth intervention, uh, just uh, for the sake of the argument. Now, in a randomized controlled trial, patients are closely monitored and reminded to submit patient level data. Also, uh, people included in the trial could be predominantly um, ill people who would rapidly progress to the worst stage of the condition without the intervention, without telehealth monitoring. Uh, it would make sense to actually focus a trial on very ill people so that uh, we can demonstrate more easily um, what's going to happen in the intervention arm of a trial uh, compared with the control arm of a trial without any intervention. But after we run a trial, we really want to run a model in the target data set of less severely ill people who will not be reminded to submit daily data by whoever is running clinical trials. People will be based 
worldwide and not just in a lab or not in, uh, in an academic health center, which is running a clinical trial for us. And uh, the standard assumption of many uh, AI machine learning models, of course, is that the training data set is the same as the sample data set at the distribution level. Samples are identically distributed. In our case, this assumption doesn't really hold anymore. There are different ages, severity, socioeconomics, ethnicity, uh, uh, patients reminded or not reminded, disease status, many, many different things might change. And this can be addressed by transfer learning, domain adaptation, those kinds of techniques. So our idea is to uh, improve performance in the target domains by transferring knowledge from the related by different source domains. So uh, various things can differ. For example, the inputs can differ. We can say that the population in the target task is not the same as the population in the source task. So a very shift problem. Our domain has shifted, right? So our inputs are different. Sometimes the label may shift and um, our prior probability. It may correspond to the different disease severity in contrast to different patient populations. For instance, patients may be less severely ill uh, when we take our telehealth intervention from a clinical trial to the real world. There may be a concept shift. For, uh, for example, a different efficacy of the intervention in the real uh, randomized control trial and the real world setting. For example, when patients are not reminded daily to submit their readouts following an intervention, maybe the intervention is not as effective anymore. So um, uh, the, these labels may potentially, or rather the mappings may shift. And um, uh, everything may potentially shift also between the target and test distributions. And um, basically we, um, want to try to derive models uh, in our source data set that would have a small error in the target data set, which we know is different from our source data set. There are many different ways of addressing this. And uh, uh, for example, we can reweight training instances so that our losses under the reweighted training instances are similar to what's happening in the target data set. We can uh, look at shared feature representations, maybe pre process our data somehow so that in the feature space, our uh, target and source tasks would look similarly. We could try to share parameters. It's quite often, uh, especially in deep neural network literature, people do use models trained on completely different tasks and maybe adopt those parameters a little bit. So there is a lot of parameter sharing, but perhaps not completely. And uh, multi-task learning is a related area. Uh, now, instead of optimizing for a single target task, we want uh, a good performance over multiple tasks. Now, this is an important result. Uh, it's a bit technical, but uh, it's quite important actually to try to understand the meaning of this. RDT is the error in the target domain, the risk in the, tar the, risk in the target domain, which we want to minimize. And RS is the risk in the source domain. And this distance here is really specific distance definition between the target and the source domain. And there are additional terms uh, where we say that uh, our risks are lower bounded by certain equations. Uh, what this really tells us is that to be able to achieve a good performance on the target task, we need to perform well in a source task, in a, um, for example, in a randomized control, uh, controlled uh, trial setting. But we also want to try to learn the representation, uh, which is where both domains are as similar to each other as possible. So to be able to, uh, just, uh, to repeat this again, to perform well in the real world, we want to perform well in the, uh, in the, uh, in the randomized controlled trial setting, for example. And we also want to ensure that whatever features, whatever, uh, whatever models are using, whatever representations, whatever samples models are using, uh, what's going to happen in the real world is going to be as close to what's happening in the trial as possible. So how can we do magical transfer learning? Due to variation in protocols, patient populations, reimbursement strategies, designs, and so forth, uh, it's very common that uh, there is a uh, distribution shift. Our source data is not the same as the training data. And this is really fundamental, uh, fundamental in healthcare. Whatever we develop in a lab or even in a trial, it's not going to be the same as uh, in the real world. So clinicians and medical research, epidemiology and clinical trial research and so forth, there are some heuristics which actually make quite a lot of sense. Um, and uh, those heuristics may be justified from the expression which we have just seen, uh, where we want a robust performance uh, in both source uh, and multiple unknown target populations. 
Uh, first, what people tend to do is to use features which are similar uh, in the target task and then the source task. So for example, if you are creating a model and we know that certain features are going to be very different uh, uh, where, uh, when we are going to use the models, maybe you should downweight those features somehow. Maybe you shouldn't really pay very much attention to those features. Or uh, in uh, clinical research, people would often replace those features. Sometimes people define an indication uh, so that models are only used for target subpopulations, which are as similar as possible to the source subpopulation. Sometimes people transform the features, use quantiles or discretizations of various kinds to decrease the discrepancy between covariates of the source task and the target task. For example, instead of taking the age variable, people can say, okay, let's use the binary indicator age above 65. Instead of taking, for example, uh, the income level uh, in euros, people say, are we in top 25%? quantile or not, or what could be the quantile of income and so forth. It's one way of basically ensuring that in the feature space, there is more, uh, there is a similarity between source and target data sets. Now, it's important to understand that quite often, there are no patient level samples from the target data set at all. So quite often when we do transfer learning and machine learning, we've got some samples, uh, quite a lot of samples sometimes from the source task. And we may have some samples from the target task. Sometimes those samples may not be labeled or we may only have a few labels from the target task. But in medicine, uh, it may often happen that there are no zero samples from the target task. So what do we do in this case? So let me now um, show a few uh, case studies. So I'll try to go through those case studies very quickly. And uh, unfortunately, because some of this work was relatively sensitive, uh, I'm a bit limited on the technical details of what can be presented, but hopefully it still kind of highlights uh, the flavor of um, what we are doing and what may potentially be done. So let's go to a statement of one of the interviewed clinicians. It's easy to let ourselves be driven by what we can do with the data rather than by the most pressing clinical needs. We see many AI solutions addressing the same tasks because those are the tasks for which the data are available. It's basically um, mentioned by one of the professionals interviewed by McKinsey. Uh, when we first read that comment, we thought, okay, well, um, it's probably true, but is this, as, as vendors, as developers of AI models, we struggle so hard to get access to clinical data sets, surely we shouldn't be uh, held responsible uh, for not being able to uh, do, uh, address real clinical needs if we cannot uh, access real clinical data sets. But then uh, we asked ourselves the question, how can we address clinical needs without accessing data sets? How can we make predictions if we have zero samples? How can we more construct something which could be of use to clinical stakeholders? Well, the, the answer to this is that if you don't really have data, then we have no choice but to rely on prior knowledge. At least this is one of the answers, and this is the answer which we gave to ourselves. So the concept of what we did was to try to extract pre-trained predictive models for a given condition and outcome from biomedical literature. You know, it's almost like completing the loop. Quite often, uh, people who are experts in AI machine learning, they try to go to the medical community and say, look, um, we are experts, uh, we have algorithms, we know how to train them. Could you please give us some data that can help you solve medical tasks? What we are trying to do really is uh, to try to mine medical evidence so that we can construct potentially more sensible and more explainable AI models and models which clinicians may want to use. And whatever uh, features, whatever we can ident identify from the published literature could be used as features, constraints, evidence-based priors for patient level AI models. Uh, it may potentially help to improve data efficiency and robustness. And uh, literally, we are combining millions of person years of medical research by trying to uh, gain some insights from clinical data. So the process is relatively simple. We start with millions of publications. We identify potentially thousands of publications related to conditions and outcomes. There are various ways of how we can rank those publications and how we can retrieve information. 
but really um, in what we call med AI, medical knowledge plus AI. We are trying to convert medical knowledge into, uh, into predictive software, which we can quickly validate and data set if those data sets are available, or which we can take a weighted average of if those data sets are not available. And uh, we can build on a lot of clinical research and construct extensive libraries of pre-trained models and risk scores on the basis of literature. And when we look at uh, this information discovery approach uh, and at the clinical needs, which we have discussed before about evidence, can we now ensure that whatever we develop builds on priors and um, builds on whatever is used in clinical practice or whatever clinicians have already identified as important quality, questions of data efficiency, for example, we don't have enough data from the case distribution, code development, nothing really replaces this, but maybe we can actually get some idea of what kinds of questions we can ask the clinicians by identifying which features appear to be important. Practicality and data issues, many of, the, of, of these questions are really addressed, or at least to some way, uh, to some extent addressed by this information mining approach. So this is how roughly it works. We specify a condition and outcome, we search for multiple models. Often we can identify thousands of publications uh, we search public repositories for PICO population intervention comparison outcome terms. We use semi supervised classification to evaluate the results as reliable and relevant um, uh, using word embeddings. And then we crawl, uh, run a crawler to access the information, PDFs and links, and uh, whatever information we can mine. Uh, uh, very, um, uh, I'll not go through this, it's basically uh, uh, set sideways about semi supervised learning. Um, People will know about this, but for the completeness of the tutorial, but this idea is that we have an unlabeled data set, which may be quite big. We have a labeled data set, which may be relatively small. The question is how can we improve the quality of predictive models trained on labeled data by also using unlabeled data? And basically this is a common setting which we have to deal with. We know we have many unlabeled papers. We don't know if it's a, a good paper or a bad paper, if it's relevant to the task which we care about construction of predictive models. Model or not, we have our in house data sets which are labeled their small data sets. Um, and then semi supervised learning, basically, um, uh, we uh, have a few labels, we have well, if more, quite a few unlabeled examples. We try to draw a decision boundary. Um, it may be a word embedding space, it may be something else, uh, depending on the task. And we want to draw a decision boundary, for example, and uh, if there is a new paper, we want to say, is it a good paper, bad paper, how informative, and so forth. And um, there are various ways of solving this. We can construct generative models exploiting the clustering structure in unlabeled data, or we can basically uh, use graph methods, propagate the labels, construct a graph between these points and propagate the labels within each graph, and also construct disagreement methods where uh, classifiers generate labels for each other, to the labels. And um, basically, we use low density. We tried many different things, but low density methods, where we basically say that, well, instead of drawing this line, this classification line over here, which may potentially uh, result in a big boundary, decision boundary, but um, we somehow favor solutions in low density areas over here. So once uh, we do the search, we classify our publications. What happens next, uh, I'll go through this very, very quickly, uh, is that we go through some text parsing. We identify tables. Quite often results are presented in tables. And we detect tables. Sometimes if uh, we deal with HTML and XML, we can find tables by parsing. Or sometimes we actually need to use uh, 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 table detection with three papers as images, and then uh, we need to detect tables. We need to uh, use uh, optical character recognition on this, and we use uh, for table detection uh, variants of uh, RCNNs and cascades of RCNNs to identify tables and mine, and uh, essentially get some information, um, no, maybe some human proofreading to get the text, to get really the results from a table. Then we classify tables. Are we dealing with regression models, or is it a table of population statistics, and so forth? So we can potentially come up with thousands of tables and table annotations, and uh, it gets converted in internal model representations. And uh, those uh, given internal representations, they can then auto-generate predictive functions. And uh, we can also auto-generate back-end API instances and also web-based front-ends. Um, it's 
um, you know, there is a human in the loop for quality control everywhere, and especially for development of exemplar files and documentation and checking whether what we could find in publications is useful or not. And what we can get, for example, for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is a library of you know many different you know, different models using different kinds of predictors based on what has been published in medical literature. And uh, this is a piece of Python code or um, PHP or whatever. Um, this is integrable with front ends, and uh, this can also run in um, uh, batch data sets so that we can validate quality of the predictions. I'm limited on what I can say about the quality of how well this works. Uh, we had six case studies across provider organizations. Meta is a, uh, it's an ensemble of literature based models. Uh, in some of those um, provider organizations, they had um, uh, auto ML commercial software packages fitting very complex black boxes, identifying the best models. And we also looked in internal uh, validations within the provider organization, what could be the added value of the meta models. So we can see that uh, this is an average. I cannot give details for each uh, of the case studies, and they cannot really say what those case studies are. Um, but uh, we see that overall, on average, those models are far more or less the same. This meta model, which combines literature based uh, scores and predictive models, has IUT 0.76 and test data 0.77 for very complex. For, for a very complex model and uh, uh, which is the same level of improvement um, uh, as uh, by using black box over meta models, uh, explainable meta models when we combine OTML and meta models. Now, when it comes to external validations, it turns out that some of the OTML packages which we use in software, uh, it couldn't really be taken from one provider to the other provider for various interoperability and um, various other issues. So we weren't able to externally new data set to validate um, uh, those OTML packages, but compared to simply taking literature-based models, uh, simple uh, models and uh, kind of meta models, we get the same uh, quality, almost the same quality as we get in internal validations when we go and validate an external data set. So uh, I know uh, I need to go very quickly. I've got one other case study, uh, which uh, can take about three minutes, four minutes, or we can go to the questions. Um, shall I continue or shall we go to the questions now? Carson? I think I would, I would uh, go on for another three to four minutes, as you said. Okay, so. okay, thank you very much. So uh, I'll uh, show another thing which we are doing. It's still work in progress. Uh, it's a preclinical screening project. Uh, we are trying to combine organs on shift, brains on shift with artificial intelligence to drive drug discovery in Alzheimer's disease. So uh, basically it's got many components, organs on shift, or brains on shift, and AI, um, and Alzheimer's is probably one of the most complex conditions. So what is the idea here? We've got candidate medications, and uh, we also have uh, brains on shift organoids, you know, those devices where we are trying to grow, not we, but our partners. It's a partnership of three companies and one university. Uh, and uh, we are growing tiny little brains from stem cells. We extract stem cells, they grow, or rather uh, in, in um, partnership, our partners grow, grow tiny brains from those stem cells. And then we bombard those tiny brains with drugs known to work or known not to work at various levels of Alzheimer, um, no, at uh, various stages of clinical trials of Alzheimer's disease. And we record what's happening basically in those organoids. We get structures resembling human brains and by videos from videos of those structures, they're trying to make a prediction of whether or not a drug for which we know the ground truth from in vivo human clinical trials, if the drug is toxic, if the drug is not toxic, it helps us to fail early and potentially screen out those drugs which are unlikely to work in humans by using organoid devices. So, um, there are some biological artifacts that show how images, the stationary image, that's how it looks like. And uh, it's a plot of the same image. Uh, and this is what's happening basically. If you try it, um, uh, another image, but they plot it in 3D, and we now threshold it exactly the same image. We say that image intensity is whatever, whatever, whatever we are getting, they are capped. Um, they are capped at a certain level. And we can now start seeing curvy structures over here, and potentially more happening in the image. So, multiple different ways of pre processing those images. And sometimes there are funny artifacts uh, in the microscope. We have, you know, um, uh, backgrounds of this kind. 
kind. And um, there are ways of how we can improve this with the fitting smooth functions to remove the background and various ways of how we can pre-process images and using boundary boxes to identify cells and also to try to see um, what could happen between the cells and what's also happening in time. Um, we are dealing with time series here. There are spatial features, there are temporal features. They can compute spatial and temporal gradients uh, to enrich our feature spaces. And um, generally, we are trying to formalize the utility of features here um, for uh, organ on chip devices, various ways to augment our data, filters, blurring, you know, usual things which we do in machine vision. And the model uh, looks like this. We've realized very quickly that uh, it's actually very difficult for us to get a lot of stem cells and to grow a lot of brains. So we needed auxiliary tasks. So starting with those videos of what's happening in the brains, uh, we defined auxiliary tasks, identifying cell types and what's happening between the cells and um, cell locations of the spikes and neurites. Data for this comes from semi-automated packages, um, uh, which um, cannot be used fully automatically, but uh, it can help to generate uh, target label data. And uh, by solving the auxiliary task, uh, uh, of predicting the features, predicting uh, predicting the cell locations, for example, uh, we uh, improve the quality of classification on the target task over here. There are multiple models which we can consider, which they only use the brain on chip to predict Alzheimer's, or we can use the brain on chip and the cell features to predict Alzheimer's, or we can say that cell features, cell locations are also part of our output. And losses are defined basically, there are many different ways to, de to define and weigh those losses, but basically we've got um, uh, multi-task setting. And uh, again, uh, the data which we have for an auxiliary task is uh, quite a lot bigger than the data which we have for the target task. And there are multiple auxiliary tasks. LAD is the target task classification loss uh, of Alzheimer's and the response to Alzheimer's disease. And uh, multiple uh, uh, auxiliary objectives about cell segmentation and displacement, uh, types of cells and also cell displacement. Sometimes we cannot really see an individual cell. Uh, we can see a cluster here. And uh, the model is really uh, something like this. And um, um, some, um, yeah, it's still ongoing work, but uh, what we can see, and perhaps this precision recall curve is the most interesting one for us to look at. At 20%, uh, um, Precision and it's a well balanced data set. A 20% uh, oh, sorry, 20% recall, we are getting nearly 90% pre uh, precision, which basically means that if you are happy to identify 20% of drugs which are going to work well in humans, then our accuracy of identifying those drugs successfully based on the data which we can see is nearly 90%. So we may miss on some potentially useful drugs, but uh, we can uh, relatively accurately say that uh, this drug uh, can potentially be useful and we can track it next. Uh, levels of clinical trials. I will skip all the future themes and I'll go to the last slide of the summary. So I would say that AI and machine learning is still probably uh, in, in healthcare. It's not probably not an infancy, it's probably in childhood. It's a regulated space. There are many constraints, safety, efficacy, cost effectiveness, uptake, and multiple stakeholders with multiple objectives, unique challenges, but it's still probably the most exciting time to be here, to be in this space. And thank you. Thank you, Felix. Yeah, these were very wise final words here. <laughs> That's the, the, the most exciting time to be here. I fully, uh, fully agree on that. There's a lot of applause uh, coming here, virtual applause. And there's also a number of questions already. So I'll, I'll do my best to, to fairly share the time here. Uh, the first one was on Slido, in fact, and I'll, I'll just read out these two, two by the same person, Helena. In your opinion, are there other fields in which explainability is as important as in healthcare? Maybe a quick question. Uh, uh, I think, uh, yes, uh, anytime when we make critical decisions, uh, for example, in law, it may be quite important. Um, uh, some people will say finance, some people will say military. There are many applications where not, uh, where having various biases uh, might have uh, a big detriment. Thank you. And the second half is, are the models you use to pass the existing literature explainable themselves? Uh, no, uh, which is good, uh, which, uh, which is good. Uh, basically what uh, they uh, use models for is to prioritize the expert's time. 
So it's not a critical application for us to identify a table in an image to uh, say that, well, first an expert should check the results from model uh, from paper A and not from paper B. We haven't found, uh, we didn't treat this as a critical application. Whenever uh, we make crit uh, clinical predictions, we try to build explainability in the models by uh, building on the prior knowledge. So um, the slide which, uh, slide which I show here, oops, uh, uh, other uh, other things. Uh, the slide which I showed here, this, uh, we try to make this model explainable because Thank we're you. dealing with the patient data. Thank you, Felix. Uh, now we have questions from the network. Uh, we, um, in, I saw them in the order: Dian, Vesna, and then Lucas in this order. So, Dian, please go first. Okay. Uh, so, thank you very much for the <clears throat> very interesting presentation. Um, I have a question. Uh, I can see at least uh, two differences in two different types of projects that we can develop using uh, machine learning in, in healthcare. So, on one hand, softwares or phone applications. And on the other hand, uh, real objects such as machines or devices. Uh, I'm wondering what do you think are the main difference, differences in the process of developing a virtual tool versus a physical tool and in the process of moving from development to actual use by patients uh, and clinicians? Okay, uh, it's a good question. Thank you, Dan. Um, uh, software as medical device is the answer to this. So software, uh, at least um, uh, in the EU, is going to be regulated uh, in the same manner as devices, as long as they're making clinical predictions or the software is going to have clinical use. So from the regulatory perspective and from what you need to go through, as long as your software is going to have a clinical use, it's going to be largely the same process. There will be probably some specific hurdles to software. And um, uh, in the UK, I'll uh, very quickly go to the slide about uh, uh, the process uh, in the NHS, um, uh, which is about data stability and data privacy. It's highly likely that those kinds of challenges are going to be slightly more specific. Uh, data protection, uh, interoperability are going to be specific additional challenges for software. Uh, on the other hand, for in vitro devices, we'll have something about how biological samples are going to be handled. But uh, both will need to be regulated in the process. Thank you. Thank you, Dian and Felix. Now, Vesna. Hi, uh, so thank you so much for the presentation. It was very good, very relevant for my research. Uh, my question is about uh, these two feature importance uh, methods you mentioned, Lime and SHAP. So in my lab, we use a lot of Shapley values to understand the contribution of each features on electronic health records that predict, uh, that helped the most for the prediction of the outcome. And uh, I was not familiar with Lime. I was wondering if there is an advantage of Lime or SHAP over the other, or if there's some kind of data that is better to use Lime or SHAP. Well, a good question. This I think um, uh, SHAP is preferred nowadays because um, uh, at least theoretically, when we can solve uh, this equation, or when we do, uh, we can do this uh, approach, uh, when we can, uh, when we can compute those feature attributions exactly, then there are good theoretical guarantees. And in line, we don't necessarily have this. There may be consistency problems, and also based on what kinds of models we use. Also, there are proximity measures in Lime. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Lime uh, is quite fast to use. And uh, Lime does help to identify features. Uh, the question of what's better is difficult because uh, it's very difficult to explain what we mean by good explainability or uh, what's uh, a robust explainability metric because Lime is simple to use. It's not a bad idea to use it, but SHAP is preferred nowadays. Okay, thank you. And then Lucas, please. Yeah, uh, hey, Felix. Nice to see you. <laughs> and, uh... It's a pleasure as always. Uh, just a quick question regarding the, the uh, literature scraping that you mentioned. I was wondering how, I don't know if you mentioned it and I missed it, but how you assess the reproducibility of the papers that you include into the scraping? Mm. Well, 
Okay, uh, there are several ways to answer this. Reproducibility of our methods, how we prioritize papers, uh, the um, assess internally because we've got this test, label this test. Reproducibility of the findings, reproducibility of the results in those papers. This is a good question. And um, um, in, uh, in specific projects which we had, we went to real world clinical data sets. Clinicians were on board for those case studies which uh, we have discussed. So those six case studies, six outcomes were in the real NHS data set where uh, we were able to run a model on a data set and see whether the model uh, performing, um, you know, to a certain level is described in the paper really uh, performs the same way in our uh, clinical practice. Thank you, Lucas. Now we have another question in the chat that I will read out. Thank you for your exciting talk. I have a question about one of the papers you mentioned when discussing saliency maps for explainability. In the slide showing the results from SEC et al, um, I understood that the saliency maps helped to show that the machine learning model wasn't actually predicting zoonomia based on a real signal, but rather because the radiologist had placed a token um, on the shoulder of the patient. Could you explain again how the token was predictive of pneumonia? Did the radiologists only place the token on patients with pneumonia and patients without pneumonia did not have a token? Um, uh, good question. I think this is what happened. This is not our work. Um, and uh, on the basis of uh, what we were able to understand, there were those kinds of biases. It happened that, uh, for example, uh, radiologists or whoever uh, 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 were dealing uh, uh, with those images were placing or one of the radiologists, some of the radiologists, maybe in intensive care and uh, emergency departments, there were different processes, but it happened for whatever reason, which we haven't really tried to elucidate ourselves, was that uh, Spurious correlations are found. Uh, in uh, some other work of the same kind, we could see that uh, uh, different kind of equipment or different processes are used in different pathways of care. In intensive care, something was happening uh, in uh, kind of uh, inpatient, uh, regular inpatient care or outpatient care, something else was happening, and uh, spurious features are predicted from that case. What exactly was happening there, I don't know. And uh, there is this paper which is useful today. Thank you, Felix. And the last question of the morning session comes from Giovanni. Thank you for your talk. It's very relevant to what I do. And I wanted to ask a question related to that. There is a lot of excitement in the machine learning community for attention models. And many people claim that they are actually a new type of interpretable models that we can try to use. Although I am a little bit skeptic, uh, skeptical about whether they are truly interpretable. Would you uh, share your opinion on that if you um, if it's something that flows the work that you do, if they are actually a possible pathway towards interpretable models or if they are, um, how to say, not as interpretable as many people claim? Mm. Uh, I think, uh, uh, Giovanni, thank you for the question. The reason why it is difficult to answer this question is because it's uh, quite difficult to say what we mean by interpretability. It's very domain specific. And uh, uh, people do use attention uh, and methods, and some of those uh, are on this list, and there are many more attention methods to explain um, what, uh, what, uh, what's going on. The criticism which some people would have would be pretty much the same as Rudin had uh, in uh, this uh, nature paper over here. So they would still be uh, trying to construct, trying to explain, trying to impose some kind of constraints on black box. We can uh, focus our attention on certain parts of images, but we don't necessarily know what's going to happen. And unless we start building in prior knowledge in our models, uh, there will be some stakeholders who will not, who will probably or highly likely to say that maybe the level of explainability which we are getting is not sufficient because what we are getting is not necessarily matching what's known from uh, clinical practice and medical evidence. But these are useful methods to know about, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Felix, for this very insightful talk and discussion round. That was excellent. A wonderful start into our summer school this morning with the talks by Magnus and, and Felix. Thank you again to both speakers. And now we have a lunch break until quarter past one. And then we continue with a talk by Chloe Agat Asenkot. Thank See you very you much. Then. Thank you very much, Felix. Thank you.